Hallelujah. Father, Jesus himself told us that it was Isaiah who saw his glory when he was high and lifted up, as we have just sung. And the windows of heaven were open to the prophet, and he saw the realms of the eternal majesty and the power and the glory and the authority and the beauty and the extent of the reign and the majesty of the Messiah, seated and praised and worshipped and adored, magnified by those seraphim. And Lord Christ has been revealed to us as well. We can read of this in his word. He has come incarnate, died for sinners, sent his Holy Spirit. The Spirit indwells every true believer in the sound of my voice who have beheld Christ as their heart has changed. They've grown soft to him. Lord, as the hardness of our wickedness, Lord, as convicted through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the proclamation of the word and repentance and faith, you turn us on the potter's wheel and allow us through the scene of Christ to be transformed into his same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. We thank you, Lord, for this vision of you and all your resplendence that we behold in your holy scriptures. And as we turn to a page in your holy word today, I pray that we would see Christ all the clearer and that in seeing him, we would be transformed to the praise and glory of his great name. Amen. Hallelujah. Today provides us the opportunity to behold Judah's king. That's the title of this morning's sermon. And it comes to us, our text, from our text in Genesis 49. Let us revisit verses 8 through 10 this morning in the legacy of Judah. So turn there with me as you're able. This is Jacob's dying song to remind you. As Jacob, over each of his sons, has proclaimed an oracle or a word of truth. In some cases, it's one of disinheritance or discipline, or it sounds quite harsh. In other cases, it's surprising and it's prophecy and blessing. And this is the category that Judah falls into. As you recall, Judah is number four of Jacob's sons. There's Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Reuben, Simeon, and Levi have all been disqualified from the provisional or ordinary privileges of the firstborn because of their sin. Judah himself, too, you would think, would be disqualified. We look back in the pages of Scripture. He was not an upstanding righteous man. However, Judah repented. He turned to Christ. And this, by grace through faith alone, example of God's redeeming power thus, bestows upon Judah the lineage of the Christ, the Messiah. Judah's king will come from his line. My aim to mo this morning in preaching is to behold the prophecies of Judah and light of Scripture in our lives. There are prophecies of things to come in the words of Jacob as he sings over his fourth song. So out of reverence for the Word of God, and before we parse this text, let us behold the Word of God. Would you stand today as you're able? Listen as His Scriptures are proclaimed in all of their authority. As we behold, listen in reverence to the Word of God in Genesis 49, 8-10. through 10. Here are the Holy Scriptures. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine, and his vestiture in the blood of grapes, his eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Let me reprise a great theme of the book of Genesis that we've touched upon, but it's been a little while since I draw, drew particular, have drawn particular attention to it. But it applies in this case, because this theme is carried forward in the prophecies of Jacob and in the lineage of his children, particularly in Judah. In Jacob's dying song, we revisit this great theme of the book of Genesis, the birth of the significant son. So you remember this when we started to mark the 
biography and the narrative and legacy, the lineage of Adam and Eve and their children, there was this hope that a son would come. Do you remember the hope that was first given in Genesis 3.15? The promise by way of God's word was that the woman's son would crush the serpent's head. So that great question rung in the hearts of the faithful in the olden days. When would the significant son be born who would crush the serpent's head? Perhaps Adam and Eve were hopeful that the birth, their firstborn, Cain, would be their savior. Perhaps Cain would crush the serpent's head. Kids, would Cain be the savior? No, No, that's correct. Cain very quickly was disqualified from this position in the slaughter of his own brother, as we recall. As the narrative continues, with the birth of Seth following the murder of Abel and the banishment of Cain, this may have renewed their hopes of salvation. Answer me this, children. Would Seth be the savior of the world? Seth? No. No. We must still wait. Who would be the significant son? Through the ages, the patriarch's hopes were kept alive through the elect line as Enoch defied death. We remember that. He stepped into glory. We remember Noah, who sailed humanity through the waters of judgment to a new world. Then comes Abraham and his covenant of light and blessing to the nations, followed by Isaac's miraculous birth when Abraham and Sarah were of old age. And then, closer to our story today, we have Jacob's extraordinary birthright. Yet the question remained. So kids, could Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob deliver us from evil hearts? and redeem this fallen world of its sin? What do you guys think? No. no, you are correct. So nevertheless, even though none of these men would be the Savior and be the Messiah, in Jacob's song, hope for a Savior still lives, though perhaps barely audible to his sons by way of his feeble, by way of his feeble and dying voice. Thankfully, his words, his oracle is written down forever in the pages of Holy Scripture, where we behold its weight and glory and light of a new covenant fulfillment. So kids, last question to begin this message. Who is the ultimate significant son? Who is Judah's king that will save us from our evil hearts and redeem this fallen world of sin and its effects? Shout his name if you know it. Amen. This morning, here's a heading for the, my message today, and it is simply this, the legacy of Jesus. As it turns out, the legacy of Judah will be the legacy of Judah, I, uh, Jesus, excuse me. He is Judah's king. He is the significant son of Judah who will come in due course. And of course, we celebrate this time of year, the waiting for his arrival and the acknowledgement of, in the, of the incarnation with his taking on flesh and coming to earth born of a woman, yes, of the lion, of the tribe, of the lineage of Judah. So let us us consider the legacy of Jesus foreshadowed, prophesied in this, this prophecy, this word of Jacob over Judah in verses 8 through 12 under three headings, three points today. Enduring might, the legacy of Jesus will be enduring might or strength. Secondly, eternal reign, his kingdom will never end. And thirdly, abundant glory, he is majestic, He is awesome. Enduring might, eternal reign, abundant glory. The legacy of Jesus, the significant son of Judah. He has enduring strength and might. Let me open with a sub point that we close our last message with. This one from Judah's line will be the second Joseph, if you will. Another Joseph will arise. Why do we say this? Well, because of verse 8 in this prophecy, Judah Your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. So when would it be the case that from Judah's line, his brothers would praise him? When would it be the case that uh, the father's sons, that is the people, the countrymen, the family, if you will, the covenant body, the, the covenant people of God would worship one or bow before or praise one from the line of Judah. Well, there are, along the journey of the narrative of Scripture, there are provisional or partial fulfillments of this. When, when David becomes king, his countrymen bow down and defer to his authority and leadership. Likewise, Solomon, they were from the tribe of Judah. 
But ultimately, ultimately, of course, this would be true of Jesus himself. He is the one before whom his countrymen would bow and his father's son, so to speak, would praise him. He is another Joseph who would arise as king of kings, like Joseph pictures, to provide that provision that all, even those of his own, would bow before him and praise his name. So consider this. The greatness of Judah, in context of Jacob's words, the greatness of Judah will be magnified by the submission of his people. The greatness of Judah's line will be magnified, proclaimed, evident, when his brothers praise him and when his father's sons bow down to him. Consider this application. I put an application note. I was talking to Isaac this week. He says, you guys need homework, so you can blame him for this one. I have some homework for you. Application note in your notes if you grabbed a copy. What are a couple areas in your life you're seeking to bring into submission to Christ? Give some thought to how your devotion in these things might serve to magnify the Lord. What are some particular areas in your life you are seeking to bring into submission to Jesus Christ, Judas King, and then give some thought of how your increased devotion or obedience in these areas bring glory to him. Think of a way you might turn a conversation. I thought of a, here's a little example. Yesterday I was in conversation with a relative of mine that I, I, I don't believe knows the Lord. And we were bemoaning the state of politics. You know, if that's a common theme, you can often strike a chord. Well, look at the idiots that lead us, right? And so I just mentioned this. I said, you know, what I'm praying for is that the sovereignty of God would override the stupidity of man, even though we don't deserve it. I'm praying that God's power overrides our foolishness, even though we don't deserve it. Well, that little phrase was kind of a, a, it could be a setup. You don't deserve it? Yes, it's grace if God save us. Man is stupid? Yes, he's fallen in sin. God is sovereign? Yes, he provides a savior. Now, our conversation didn't move much beyond that. But if you take opportunities, for example, to share Christ in conversation with others, what does it do? Well, you, in submission to him, are telling the truth of the gospel, taking opportunity to share Christ. And how does it magnify the Lord? Well, it tells the truth about him. There's many people that you know that may not be attending church regularly. They don't hear the message, Christ is Lord. They don't read their Bible with regularity or take it seriously in its claims. But you can draw attention to the, to the glory of Jesus Christ by simply stating something true of the Messiah. And it's a great time of year to do that as well. So there's a little application for you to draw attention to the might, the strength, the glory, the authority of Jesus, and to ask ourselves how our duty to that might serve to glorify him. Let's explore this lion metaphor. How does Judah's use of this picture of a lion help us to understand the strength and the power of the Messiah? Verse 9, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness who dares rouse him. Jacob uses illustrations that might be a little bit weird sounding to us because we're not always prone to use like metaphors from the animal kingdom to describe people's character traits. Oh yeah, you were really like a, that was a golden retriever thing to do. Or he, he's, a, he's a real like hyena of a guy. We don't often speak that way. However, some of these character traits can be useful in describing uh, if we understand how Jacob is using imagery. Jacob uses illustrations from the animal kingdom throughout his poetry here, and with respect to the Messiah, or the promise of Judah's, lion, uh, Judah's line, the lion metaphor is a fitting picture. What does it tell us? Well, first, ascendancy, that is rising to rule. According to Jacob, Judah starts out as a cub, but then he kills his prey and dominates. Do you see that? Judah is a lion's cub. Isn't that interesting? There's a birth that's presumed in a cub. There's an infancy in a cub. But within that cub, that lion cub, it might look super cute and cuddly. And maybe you could even hold one with any, without getting scratched too bad. But just give it a few months, and that lion's cub is a formidable beast. And in its wild, unnatural form, you wouldn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. You would just view it through the, you know, safely through the bars of a cage. There would be one, unassuming at first, in his birth, who would be born as a lion's cub. In his infancy, he would be easily disregarded and overlooked. 
but he would grow and ascend and his power would be manifest. And over time, he would take his prey. And when he did, it would come to a point where the greatest kings of the earth didn't want to touch his authority with a 10-foot pole because he rules with a rod of iron against his enemies, even as he welcomes his own by dying for them into his kingdom forever. This is the lion cub of Judah, so to speak, now ruling and reigning in his ascendancy from glory. Lion metaphor. Victorious dominion. It says, from the prey, my son, you have gone down. Stoop low, he crouched as a lion. So uh, you have gone up. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. So again, the picture of a lion. The lion slaughters the prey, right? And then he ascends to the hill and he guards over his kill, let's say. So this is, again, a picture of victorious dominion. It's a reference to the secure position of the lion who is deft at climbing and commands the high place. You guys remember the Lion King, Pride Rock or something like that? Sort of a king of the hill imagery. The lion, the king of the beast, dominates that place of prominence. It's an imposing presence. It's a secure position. And it indicates that in Judah, future dignitaries would have this victory and this command, this dominion. And of course, this became true again in uh, increasing measure as we move forward through history. And, and then thirdly, there's this invulnerability. That, that is that you can't touch them, that, and if you do, you do so at your own risk. As a lioness, who dares rouse him? So let me illustrate this with a quick story. If I get it wrong, next time you guys see Joel, my brother, kids, you can ask him to verify. One time we were at the Minnesota Zoo, right? And there was a bridge a railing, and above it, my parents probably remember this a little bit, above it was this wire cage, and there was this full-grown panther soaking up the sun and sleeping, you know, in the afternoon on that cage. So Joel had a great idea. He decided to stand on the railing and just tickle the panther's paw, right? So he just reached up and tickled the panther's paw right through the, uh, through the hole in that cage. At the speed of primal outrage, that cat woke up from its afternoon nap immediately ready to slaughter my brother and tear him to shreds. A growl, a snarl, a loaded coil, spring muscles, and a beating against that cage in an instant, frightening. Of course, he fell off the rail. He was fine. Why? Because it was in a cage. If it had not been, you guys probably wouldn't get to meet my brother, Joel. So what does this picture, what Jacob pictures here? As a lioness, who dares to rouse him? Do not mess with Jesus Christ. Herod thought he could. Look what happened to him. He died in the midst of a self-exaltant worship session and was eaten by worms. He tried to kill the Messiah earlier on and by, you know, infecting or uh, by exacting an infanticide over all the kids under two in Bethlehem. What happened to him? He tried to touch the lioness. There's nothing quite as fierce as a mother lion guarding her cubs. You don't want to go up and pull a practical joke on her. It will come at a big cost. Only a fool toys with the power and authority and majesty of Jesus Christ. And this is what Judah, or this is what the prophecy of Judah foretells. So that's another Joseph will arise. This lion metaphor expanded. And then let me give you the lion metaphor fulfilled for this. Turn to Revelation 5. In Revelation 5, we have this imagery of a line come to fruition and fulfillment, but there's an added dimension which is surprising and adds even more weight and strength to the picture. So in Revelation 5, 1, the eyes of the Apostle John are opened, and this is what he sees. I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within And on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep, John speaking, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Now what does the scroll represent? represents hope for the future. Somehow John knows intuitively in this picture that the scroll must be opened and no mere man, no mere even celestial being angel has the power to release or the authority those seals. And this is why he weeps. An insufficient power. There is no one to save us. We think back to the questions I opened this sermon with. Would it be Cain? Would it be Enoch? Would it be Noah? Would it be Abraham? 
Would it be David? Would it be Solomon? Time and time again, the hopes of the people were let down if they put them in a mere human. Who can open the scrolls of God's purposes to redeem all of history? Who can open the scrolls of the heart as diamond human heart and soften it and create it new again? Who can, who can open up the scroll of the future of this world caught dead in its trespasses and sins and bring it back to its original created intent as a holy habitation for a righteous and awesome God and man uh, once and for all cleansed from his sin. Nobody can open the scroll. One of the elders said to me, verse 5, Weep no more. Behold, who? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw, the scene changes, a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, with which the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And, proceed, and then the, this imagery proceeds accordingly. Let me pause there without expanding everything of the imagery. Leave it at this. There is a lamb lion that will arise from the tribe of Judah, stronger than any earthly ruler who preceded him. Stronger in part because he is not just a lion, ferocious in his authority, but he is a lamb, stooped low, taking on the burden of sin, incarnate, took on flesh, vulnerable to the point of death to take on uh, the duty of redemption, to take on the terms of redemption and be crucified in our place. These are the greatest exploits of all. The testimony of Jacob confirmed and expounded in Jesus Christ. And in these, even these pictures picked up in the book of Revelation. What does it signify? That a covenant, significant son, will be, or that the greatest exploits through the covenant, significant son, Jesus Christ, will be accomplished when the lion becomes a lamb who will die for his people. And by this atoning means and power, he will do, he will open the seals that no one could ever open. Among them, they are the following. He will regenerate his people. He will indwell his people by his spirit. He will sanctify them. He will resurrect them. He will glorify them. He will destroy all his enemies. He will abide with his people forever. That's about seven. <laughs> and I'm not saying those correspond directly with the seven seals, but there, that's just one of so many things you could say about the power and the glory of the lamb lion, Jesus Christ. This is the legacy of Jesus prophesied over Judah of old of his enduring might. It's a surprising might that extends far beyond what man could ever dream or imagine or accomplish. And Jesus Christ alone is the significant son of Judah to come. Second major point, the legacy of Jesus, the significant son of Judah, not only enduring might and strength, but eternal reign. The images continue with pictures, symbols of kingly rule. Verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So here we have a scepter metaphor. What is a scepter? Uh, kids, let me ask you, who holds a scepter in his hand? That would be a king. Very good. So a king would hold a picture, an emblem, a symbol of his authority in his hand. You guys remember the story of Esther? And that scepter figures into the plot where the king would extend this symbol of his favor. Esther was welcomed into his presence. This is the ruler's staff. This is the symbol of law-giving and law-enforcing authority. Anyone who doesn't defer ultimately to Jesus Christ, by the way, has no right to wield the scepter and he will be judged for doing so. Uh, this law-giving and law-enforcing authority that the royal scepter or rod represents can be understood in two ways. One, it can be extended in favor to his subjects in good standing with him, and it can be wielded in judgment against his enemies. The scriptures speak of Jesus having a rod in hand or in his mouth even to destroy his enemies who refuse to acknowledge his law-giving and his law-enforcing authority. This is the scepter metaphor expounded. Jacob's not the only one to recognize prophetically by the Spirit of God. Another unlikely prophet, Balaam, would come later 
and in spite of himself would prophesy to the wicked king Balak, you know, the inevitable future in the hands of the sovereign God. In Numbers 24, 17, what does he say? I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Eternal reign, eternal authority. The royal family will survive. In spite of everything that might threaten the line of the Messiah, even famine and exile to Egypt right now in the text and in many other things that will come in the future, this prophecy, nevertheless, of Jacob goes on to say that tribute shall come to him and the ruler's staff will never be removed from between his feet. And many commentators take this to, be, to mean that the royal family will survive. The Old Testament, by the way, centers around the unlikely fulfillment of this prophecy. Time and time again, when all hope was lost and the odds were stacked against the prophecies of the covenant coming true, the Lord demonstrated his lion-like authority and providence over history and purposes um, in the time measured by the progress of redemption, that is history, and fulfilled his word. Think of the book of Jud Judges, how depressing on the surface it is. You know, cycle after cycle of depravity and one kind of long shot hero arises. He tells everybody, you should probably worship me or another God. And then the people fall once again, victim to their own vices. And at the end, there's no king in Israel. Everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes. What's the very next book after Judges in the canon? It's the touching, redemptive, personal, miraculous story of Ruth. In a world of decimated by the judges' failures, and when all seemed lost for covenant hope, a woman is redeemed from Moab who would be in the line of the tribe of Judah, would bear a son, and Obed, Jesse, David, Solomon, the royal family survives. And this is what Jacob prophesies here, and we see his prophecy picked up all the way through Scripture, all the way, of course, until the coming of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 2.19, Joseph receives word from the angel, flee to Egypt. Why? Because the royal family must survive. Because though Jesus is just a lion cub at this time, the scepter will not be taken from his hand. The ruling staff will not be removed from his grasp. Instead, Herod's policies of decimating the children of Bethlehem will prove ineffective against the purposes of God as Jacob, guided by the Spirit and his agent sent by way of angel, ushers away the line of the tribe of Judah to Egypt to be safe from the predatory anger of a false king. The royal family survives. Finally, under this point, eternal reign, vassal nations all. He will reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and they become his footstool. 1 Corinthians 15. Tribute shall come to him until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Tribute, obedience of the peoples. Remember last week, kids, your verse, Revelation eleven fifteen. I have it under here. I'll just remind you. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. Can you guys finish it? And he, and he will reign forever and ever. Amen is coming today and even now is the case where the title deed of all the nations as i often say will be evidently jesus christ when did he receive it upon his ascension jacob prophesied it here psalm 2 reiterates psalm 110 daniel 7 acts 1 the ascension all this relates to this here we won't expand on all those passages today but there's more homework for you if you're so inclined psalm 2 psalm 110 daniel 7 acts 1 Notice how Jacob's words come to pass in the course of history. As tribute comes to him, and the obedience of the peoples becomes his. Are you his people today? Are you obedient to Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered your own right to rule your life? If you have, you've proven Jacob's words true. You are his vassal people. That is, you are his servant. You are his slave, slave of righteousness. You are his, but our relationship with Jesus is so incredible that not only are we his servant, we are also uh, his brother. We are the sons of God, saints and members of the household of God. It's amazing the relationship that we have. Nevertheless, we as his people in good standing and as his citizens relate 
to this truth and this picture of his eternal reign because we are his subjects. Finally, abundant glory. The legacy of Jesus, the significant son of Judah, is seen in the prophecy of Jacob and that he will have enduring might, he will reign eternally, and he is clothed and is abundantly glorious. Clothed in and is abundantly glorious. Verse 11, the picture, pictures continue. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vestiture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth are whiter than milk. Whatever could this mean? Well, the rest of Scripture makes it clear. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 21. Here I submit to you, it's perhaps the first prophecy of the triumphal entry. Speaking of a king, this verse anticipates one from the tribe of Judah who would be welcomed and worshipped, and he would be obeyed and celebrated as king and Messiah one day. And of course, in Matthew 21, we find that this animal prophesied thousands of years ago is deployed in the service of our king. Verse tw- or, uh, Matthew 21, 1, When they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage, and the, to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them. Who needs them? The Lord. He will send them at once. Capital L, Lord. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, this comes from Zechariah 9.9, by the way, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And I'm submitting to you that you could say the following as well. This was spoken by the prophet Jacob, that he shall tie his colt to the vine. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, Uh, The donkey and the colt, they put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Others cut branches from the trees, spread them on the road. And what did the crowd shout? Hosanna to the son of David. The line of Judah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Do you see the fulfillment of Jacob's words here? Here is one triumphantly riding in on the colt, the beast prophesied by Jacob and by Zechariah, into the place where his throne is pictured in Jerusalem. And he is doing so heralded by his subjects. These are all people from Judah, we assume, or primarily so. And they, being his brothers and his father's sons, they bow before him and they praise him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Behold, the son of David has arrived. Who is this? This is Judah's king. Now, the picture goes on. Not only is there this triumphal entry that is pictured in Zechariah 9, 9, Matthew 21, 1 through 9, and fulfilled, excuse me, in this passage here, and then fulfilled in Matthew 21, 1 through 9. But Jacob also pictures the majesty of the king of Judah, Judah's king, by virtue of his property, what he owns, and what he wears, you could say, and his person. So these are metaphors of majesty. Listen, he has washed his garments in wine, his vestiture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. Prior to that, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. For further study and reference, you might look at a passage like Micah 4, 1 through 5, which prophesies a time when implements of war are hammered into agriculture tools. It's a picture of peace and prosperity. Swords will be beat into plowshares, sometimes the prophets declare. And then they prophesy a time when Christ is king and his law reigns and people are willing subjects to him that will result in every man dwelling, listen, under his vine and fig tree. It's a picture of peace and prosperity under the rule and reign of the great King Messiah. This is why we stand for the scriptures as the rule and standard of righteousness, because we know it's in the best interest of all the people. Because when Jesus is Lord and acknowledged as such, and his people praise him and honor and magnify him and submit to him, society does as well, it creates conditions conducive to peace, true peace. And implements of war can be beat into plowshares, and the result is prosperity and abundance. 
and everybody's beast can be tied to their vine. The uh, picture is that I have so, my land is so fertile, I no longer live a subsistence lifestyle, hand to mouth, growing crops to feed me, but I have enough land holdings, I have time, I have favorable conditions of the environment, I have richness of soil, I'm surrounded by grapevines. Let's just tie my animal right to this grapevine. Normally you would never do such a thing because that animal might get scared and jerk that vine out of the ground or damage it in some way. It's this picture of overflowing abundance surrounded by the blessings and the provisions and the evidence of God's wisdom and glory. It's an it's a expectation of the return of the conditions of Eden which overflow with the provision of the Lord. It's picked up in the picture of the promised land as described, a land flowing with milk and honey. They come back with grapes the size of footballs. Well, I don't know if they're that big, but it's a fitting metaphor for our culture this time of year. And this is the picture that's used here. So here, majesty of the Messiah by virtue of his property, what he owns, and when his rule takes effect, what it will produce. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the master cultivator of the great vineyard of his church. This whole world will be redeemed and submitted to him. And this is what will happen one day in the course of history through Judah somehow. And we know quite a bit about this because the Bible continues on this theme. And of course, it's fulfilled in Christ. His vesture in the blood, is dipped in the blood of grapes. His garments are washed in wine. So the things that he wears also are pictured are pictures of glory. Vineyard, grapes, milk, honey, peace, prosperity, royalty, joy, not subsistence, but superabounding. This is basically the language that's deployed here. The glorious abundance is applied to his clothing and to his countenance, as well as to the property and the environment and the dwelling, the habitation of himself with his people. Now, you might think to yourself, well, you know, how do you get all that from this? Well, you can't unless you read the rest of Scripture. So it's just a little lesson in hermeneutics, which means rightly reading the Bible. When you see images like this of a messianic prophecy where clothes and property are used as examples of his majesty, ask yourself, where else is that pictured in, in the Bible? And one answer will come, and again, let's turn to the book of Revelation um, at the close of the canon as John's eyes are open. And he sees confirmed in similar imagery what Jacob saw in shadowy form here. So before I read this text, let me just say this. That the language of glorious abundance applied to the clothing and countenance, so that would be what he wears and how he looks, his person, uh, of the Messiah. So this shadowy figure that Jacob beholds and prophesies over Judah is revealed with crystal clarity to the Apostle John at Pat Patmos. So as the book of Revelation opens, notice how the clothing and the person of Jesus is pictured. This majesty by virtue of who he is and how he shines. Verse 12, then, turn, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. A picture, by the way, of Jesus' pedigree or history birth rooted in his humanity. The son of man is, to, that is to say, the son of Judah, the son of David, and so forth, son of Jacob. So in the midst of the golden lampstands was one like a son of man, clothed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice like the roar of many waters. We think of the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the shining in full strength. Like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, how does John respond? I fell at his feet though, as though dead. But he laid his right hand upon me. Only the lamb lion can do this. Only the lamb lion can lay his hand upon you when you fall as though dead before the Messiah and say, fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Because the lamb lion died 
because this one who's clothed in such majestic glory, pictured here, perfect in his judgments, because he died in our place, he can touch us with his hand and confer to us, so to speak, resurrection life, as he did all through his ministry, and we be made in that picture worthy of his presence because of his healing, redeeming, scarred hand that died for us. This is the picture fulfilled of what Jacob anticipates when he remarks on the majesty of the Judah king to come by his clothing, what he wears, by his person, who he is, prefiguring these great acts of power and redeeming glory and authority that he will accomplish in history. This is our Lord and Savior. This is our Messiah. And his abundant glory was pictured even in shadowy form, albeit through images like uh, grapes and so and uh, clothing, all the way back in Genesis 49. Let me close this morning's message with an Advent application. What is Advent? Well, it's the time of year when we celebrate the waiting of the Messiah. We kind of put ourselves, if you are familiar with the tradition, in the shoes of those who were waiting for Jesus to come. And who was in those shoes? Everyone prior to the Incarnation. Remember, a central theme of Genesis 49, Jacob says, himself says, verse 18, I wait for your salvation, O Lord. We return again in closing here to the opening theme as well, that Judah's brothers will praise him, they will bow before him. And so think of Advent, think of the coming of Jesus Christ, and how these pictures of Jacob's song came to fruition. As Christmas approaches, perhaps you can keep in mind these words as you read of those first shepherds, Anna and Simeon in the temple, in Luke chapter 2, 8 through 38. These, I submit, were the very first of the direct fulfillment of Jacob's song. They were the ones who, uh, from the tribe of Judah, the brothers and the sons among the people of God were first to recognize and bow before their Messiah. And when they did, oh, the ma- oh how in their devotion did they serve to magnify the greatness of God. Lowly shepherds commissioned as ambassadors to share now abroad the message that unto us is born a king lowly and lying in a manger. So as we look forward to Christmas, we see these words fulfilled and a good example of a heart that we can share. Perhaps this season, you might take your kids outside, your family, you might take a moment on one of these clear, almost winter nights. I love these nights where the moon is shining brightly or if it's not, if the moon's on the other side, uh, you know, shining on China right now, you can see the stars all the brighter. You look up at that sky shining with the array of stars stretched and imagine that same array stretched over the shepherds that glorious night. Consider as you view these heavens the might and glory of their great artist. Perhaps you speak in hushed tones to your children. Who made the stars? I like to whisper that question to my little guys. As you look up at these unreachable, unfathomable, mysterious heavens that still captivate the attention, the scientific enterprise, and the imagination of people even today, you picture this and then you think, who formed them? Who set them in their course such that it holds precisely today, same as the day the shepherds witnessed these heavens splitting and a doorway of glory might step from heaven to earth, and Jacob's ladder might be fulfilled in their lifetime. Next, marvel how the creator of the universe stepped immeasurably lower than these heavens, even to our world, cursed by sin. Lower still, if you will, to the confines of a fallen woman, though virgin's womb. Lower still to the feeding trough, of, uh, trough if you will, of beasts, and even lower to the cross of unspeakable shame and torture. To answer what? The divine cry of Jacob. I'm sorry, the dying cry of Jacob in Genesis 49, 18. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. This is the lion lamb stepping low that we behold this time of year and in the incarnation 
we remember what he has done to answer Jacob's prayer. Have you bowed low to the Messiah King of Judah's line? How do we bow and praise him? Well, firstly, you may well know, but perhaps you have unbelieving children yet who must learn by the Spirit's use of the Word of God in your instruction and admonition, first, in worshiping and submitting to the Messiah, how do we do so? We unconditionally surrender. We repent of our sins. And we trust Jesus to save and to rule us. We trust him to save and to rule us. And how do we bow to his rule? We proclaim to our families and to our friends, for one, what he has done. And here's just a second application point. It struck me that Jacob uses the occasion of his death. He's, he's about ready to die. He uses that occasion in his life to point his family to the purposes of God. And you could write this down too. What are some occasions in your life that you might use to point your family to the purposes of God? Has there been a recent death that allows you to tell your children about a power stronger than death? The lamb lion who, champions, who is a champion of the grave. How about Advent season itself? Is that an opportunity in life and even as Christmas is approaching where you might point your children or your family or those who listen to the purposes of God? Now, in case you need help in doing this, uh, the church has ordered some books. So I, I received a recommendation recently in my listening to a Advent, ser or a Advent devotional that begins on November 28th. So if you would like, if you don't have something and you'd like something to follow in this Advent season, to take the occasion of the season, to point your family to Christ, then ask me afterward and it will be Providence's gift to you. So I just want to leave you with that as well. As we close this sermon, in summary, remember that the scriptures of old in Genesis 49 proclaim over Judah the legacy of Jesus. He is the significant son from this line to come. And in the words of this patriarch, we behold his enduring might, how strong he is, his eternal reign, his kingdom will never die, and his abundant glory. Let me leave you with, it, with this. So long as the Lord waits to return, and, and he will, when the fullness of his elect, elect are saved to worship him, let us herald the good news. Let's stand and sing one more song. We open this morning worshiping and heralding the good news in song. Let us do that again as we respond to his word proclaimed today. Thank you, Jesus, for your scriptures. May you write them on the tables of our hearts. May your word be proclaimed, not just by its pages here, but by our proclamation and application of the same in the days following to the praise of Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen.